Hello, everyone. Happy Friday. Today on the final bar, we will wrap the week. We'll focus on how the markets have evolved from last Friday to this Friday. The S&P eclipsing the 4,700 level for the first time today, closing just below that threshold. But overall, stocks very much in uh, offense over defense. Leadership today, energy and industrials, number one and number two, followed by utilities. So it's not just a straightforward offense versus defense. It's all about focusing on the charts, what's working and what's not. Ladies and gentlemen, this is The Final Bar. Hello, everyone. Welcome to The Final Bar. I'm your host, Dave Keller. I'm the Chief Market Strategist here at StockCharts.com in a sunny Redmond, Washington. Thanks for joining us every week after the close as we focus on the market environment using the power of StockCharts.com, using technical analysis, technical indicators, and the best practices of trend following and momentum investing to better quantify investor behavior and focus on the, where the opportunities might lie. I've done a lot of interviews this week for different media outlets on sort of the market outlook going through year end into next year is pretty natural given uh, the earnings season. We're sort of uh, winding down here given the Fed meeting this week, uh, jobs number this morning and all the sorts of uh, those themes come out, you know, where should we be headed? I think what I keep coming back to is, uh, is three things. Number one, the strength of the overall market environment, the fact that indexes are making new all time highs that by definition is bullish. Number two, just the seasonal trends, November and December tend to be pretty strong. So if we would have a significant drawdown right now, it would actually be very unusual. Finally, the lack of, uh, of weakness or the lack of, lack of strength, rather, of uh, defensives, right? The defensive part of the market's not doing great, although a day like today when utilities are third from the top, of course, I say that and I glance down and look at utes and think maybe I should be paying attention to the relative strength of utilities if I haven't already. We'll get to all of that and more in our Wrap the Week segment. I do want to let you know about the schedule coming up. We had great guests this week. Had a lot of fun with John Kosar uh, and, uh, and others this week uh, sharing their thoughts on the market environment. Uh, just to let you know what's coming up next uh, couple of weeks on the show, we have a couple of really, uh, really good guests to share with you. Larry Tentarelli from Blue Chip T Daily is going to join us next Tuesday, the 9th. Uh, on Thursday, the 11th, Joe Duarte from Joe Duarte in the money options.com. The week after on the 16th, we have Jesse Felder from the Felder Report. So these all three of them, I think of them as really effective stock pickers. These are ones that are, uh, you know, looking for ideas and they tend to bring tickers that uh, that are super appreciated because it, uh, it helps you focus on some of the actionable movements. So it should be a lot of good ideas coming from our guests. Also wanted to let you know tomorrow on Saturday the 6th, Arthur Hill, a longtime contributor to StockCharts.com and a name and a face I know familiar to many of you, uh, will be doing a special event called Trend Following Theory, Expectations, and Reality. That's going to run tomorrow, uh, Saturday at noon Eastern on StockCharts TV. Art is one of the best at focusing on trend following, the importance of quantifying uptrends and downtrends and how to build an effective trading system based on trend following. So if you've not watched him and, uh, and, and heard his share his, uh, his routine with you before, I would certainly encourage you to do that tomorrow, noon Eastern on Stock Charts TV. Let us wrap the week. We're going to start with a poll question. We always have a poll running on our live stream page on stockcharts.com and also through social media. And we asked you recently, where does Bitcoin, and on stock charts, that's dollar sign BTCUSD, where does Bitcoin finish the year 2021? And I gave you four choices, above 60,000, between 40 and 60, between 20 and 40, below 20,000. What was interesting is only 4% of you collectively answered below 40,000, which is interesting. Talk about a trade that no one is prepared for. It's that one. I'm always looking for the outlier that most people are not looking for. 26% of you said between 40 and 60,000. And then a full 60% of you, uh, sorry, a full 70% of you said above 60,000. Um, and if you ask me, that's probably the answer I would have uh, would have given. It's interesting, though, and I, I get the idea that uh, that uh, that was sort of spread between those first two. The question, I think, for a lot of you, do we finish above or below 60,000? I, I don't think there's any debate that over sort of the 
uh, you know, the, the longer term time frame, the price structure in Bitcoin is fairly constructive. The sort of drawdown that we saw earlier in the year and the rotation back to new highs is often what happens before Bitcoin propels and goes order of magnitudes higher than or orders of magnitude higher than we expected uh, it might do. However, what's interesting is it just recently in the last couple of weeks bouncing off of 58,000. So we're literally right at the cusp of that. Uh, of those two. Again, I, I I would tend to give the path of least resistance as higher here, given the strength that you've seen up until, uh, you know, uh, reclaiming the previous highs. And I think if and when we get above those previous highs uh, from April and sustain that, which would be getting above this pink line around 65,000, I think there's much further upside to potentially be had. The question is the timing of it between now and, uh, and year end. I think most of you are sort of in the right place, sort of right in that uh, range. I would probably argue above 60,000 if given the choice. Let's continue on today's uh, show, focusing on wrapping the week here. And what we'll do is uh, is just talk very quickly about what the markets did today. We're going to look at the uh, long term uh, long term trends uh, by starting with the uh, the week and how the week evolved, and then look at the mindful investor live chart list. Get through as many of those as we can. So the S and P, you know, pierced the forty seven hundred level, closed just below that. So we'll call it right around forty seven, up, up a third of a percent from yesterday, and that you know uptrend in in large and mid and small continues. Today was really about the small cap indexes uh, performing much better, though two plus percent on the S and P small cap six hundred versus a third of a percent for the S and P. So that trend of small over large certainly uh, continuing uh, leading into the weekend here. The VIX actually higher today, uh, moving up. Uh, almost one whole point to be just above 16. It's recently bouncing off of the 15 level. That was one of the lowest readings, uh, really the lowest reading, tied the lowest reading uh, for the year, but still pretty elevated relative to where we were back in like 2019, for example. So that year we actually uh, spent time between 10 and 20 uh, on the uh, on the VIX. So, you know, low relative to 2021, not so low relative to other low volatility environments. If you want to dig more into that, my show yesterday, we dug into sentiment readings, including the VIX, in a little more detail. Interest rates coming off here, and I think one of the key stories going into the weekend is the 10-year yield going from 152 down to around 145 today, which is where it ends the day. Uh, dollar sign TNX is what we use to track the 10-year yield. Bond price is a lot higher today, and this is after the Fed meeting uh, earlier this week. Gold and silver moving materially higher with gold up 1.3%, just a nice move higher on the GLD. As we talked about, I think on yesterday's show, the challenge with the GLD is it still has not gotten to new swing highs. A day like today is encouraging. I will believe the upside potential in gold if and when we eclipse the previous highs from earlier this year. Finally, cryptocurrencies, sort of choppy mixed uh, session overall uh, through the course of the last uh, 12 hours, Bitcoin has gone lower and it's dancing around that 61,000 level. And again, we, as we talked about in the, uh, in the survey, I think holding above 60,000 is certainly an important level to pay attention to. Let's look at the week and how the week actually played out. This is our wrap the week chart. We're just looking at the major asset classes using ETFs. We start the clock last Friday and we look to where we're at at the US equity close today, and we'll see how these movements have played out. Here's the S&P 500 in black, which is up uh, just over 2% for the week. So a decent move higher. Uh, and, uh, and, and again, it, uh, if I knew nothing else about the market, but the fact that the S&P, the NASDAQ, the Russell 2000, the Russell Midcap, or the S&P Midcap Index, transports, industrials, all of those were making new all-time highs. That's enough to feel fairly constructive uh, for, the, uh, for the markets. What outperformed the S&P this week? Here's the NASDAQ 100 up 3.3%. And the big winner, small caps, the Russell 2000 ETF up 6% uh, for the week. So, and again, if you look at the long-term charts, small caps have outperformed large caps year to date, but in the last six months, that's where large has done a lot, uh, a lot better. It's that sideways trend in the uh, in the Russell 2000, while the S and P was making new new all time highs along with the Nasdaq. That's starting to change. You're seeing a reemergence of small cap leadership. Everything else below the S and P for the week, gold was not too far off, up 1.9 percent. In red, we have the bond. Uh, bond prices using the TLT up 1.2 percent. A couple of these were right around the zero level. That's the U.S. dollar using the UUP, which is up uh, just above zero. And in orange, we have emerging markets right about the same. Two that were down for the week: crude oil prices, which were down here uh, 1.1 percent uh, lower using the USO. And here's Bitcoin actually finished the week down two percent. Again, this is coming off of a new all-time high for Bitcoin, but really, if you look at the chart, certainly appears to be a big double top pattern. The the high that you saw earlier in the year, re, uh, 
uh, approaching that high, not really able to sustain any gains above there. And now we're bouncing uh, down below those levels. And overall, the question is, do you see strength reemerge? Do you see buyers push the price of Bitcoin back to new all-time highs and beyond? Let's finish off looking at the Mindful Investor Live chart list. This is a chart list that I keep maintained on StockCharts.com uh, pretty regularly. I usually don't update a lot of the charts until Friday because uh, you know it's, you can over tweak these things if you're looking at them too often. But as a reminder, if you want to get to this chart list, click on the Articles tab on Stock Charts. Go to my page, which is called the Mindful Investor, and you'll see a, a button at the top that says Live Chart List. And that is certainly a place, uh, that, that's a place to get to this uh, list of charts. I keep them updated. You can save them to your login, share with your friends, do whatever you like. We're going to start with the uh, market trend model. I'm actually, as I might have mentioned this, I'm in the process of sort of migrating my market trend model. Uh, I've used this same model for years, but I have often uh, found the value in tweaking things if, uh, if it doesn't feel like they're doing what's intended. And for me, the long-term model has been fairly appropriate. The long-term model turned bullish in June and has remained bullish since then. The short-term model has captured a number of these short-term pullbacks during the year, but it spent most of the year above the zero line, showing you that the short-term trend is pos positive. And it's very simply looking at where we're at relative to the five-week exponential moving average. That remains uh, very, very strong today. So the short-term and long-term models remaining very positive. The medium term model for me for the longest time has just been the weekly PPO or the weekly MACD is what I originally used. I switched to the PPO because it makes it a little historical comparisons a little bit easier. And overall, over time, it's been a very good way of capturing sort of that intermediate term trend. What's been frustrating and challenging to me over the last year and a half is how I think how poorly my medium term trend model has actually tracked the market, particularly in the last six months. When I see the S&P and the NASDAQ making new all time highs, I would think my medium term model would be fairly constructive because that's kind of what the trend is uh, that, that you're tracking, right? That's the trend. It's been negative because of the pace of the trend, because of the nature of it, and really because you accelerated earlier and then have sort of tapered off and the trend has slowed down. The, the slope has decreased. And that caused the weekly PPO to register a sell signal there in May. And it just barely didn't make a buy signal uh, today on Friday's close, really, really close. And I was watching that to see if you get enough of a rally, you really would have to move a little higher going into the close to signal a buy signal. So it's not quite there yet. So in the next couple of weeks, I'll probably share with you the new market trend model that I've been uh, working on, I'm just doing a bunch of testing and looking at historical data to see what matches uh, the, the data a little, uh, little closer, a little more closely. And again, for me, I'm not worried too much about, uh, about the structure of it and the inputs necessarily, because for me, the model is not something that, uh, you know, that I uh, would use as an output. I use that as an input. I want something that tells me what the different trends are on different timeframes so that I can overlay a subjective uh, process on top of that. So more to come there, but overall, the model mixed with the medium term model in current form, very, very close to registering a buy signal. If we continue in these same ranges, next week, it certainly would do so. The S&P uh, has a very high RSI. So it's in overbought uh, state, it's above 70. And now it's nearing the extremely overbought region, which is above 80. What's interesting, one of the charts we'll look at a little later, it's actually very rare that the RSI on the entire S&P 500 becomes extremely overbought or above 80. And the reason is because individual stocks, you'll see that a lot, but rarely do so many stocks move at one time that it allows the entire index because to become extremely overbought. I'll share with you some of the historical tendencies around that, but overall, it's fairly unusual and usually happens toward the end of a big bull market move, to be honest with you. We'll look at that data here in a little bit. Overall, I think when you're looking at the trend, the trend is certainly positive. Higher highs are bullish. That's what we've experienced in the last couple of weeks. Getting above 45.50 was it for me. That told me to not be too cautious, to be more risk on, and to think about potential upside. I think as long as we remain 40, above 45.50, that thesis remains in good shape. And if we would break that 44.80 or so, which would be the 50-day moving average, would be the next uh, thing to look at. The break of the 50-day there in September was one of the things that certainly caused us to be pretty cautious in this area. Regaining that told us to, uh, to, to sort of uh, think about further upside potential. That's how I would play any pullback going forward. My very subjectively color-coded but highly accurate uh, measures of breadth, the uh, cumulative advanced decline lines, all green now. And what I've, did there, what I've done there is uh, last week, I sort of rotated two of them from neutral to positive because they'd eclipsed their September highs. Two of them had not quite done so. And I think as of, as of today, and these aren't updated for Friday's close just yet, but uh, most likely they, they move higher. And overall, they've all gone above their September highs. So the S&P had gone higher 
but all the advanced decline lines had not quite confirmed new highs. They have all done that, telling me that the breadth conditions are fairly, con fairly constructive. We have a question on the 50 and 200 day uh, coming up in our mailbag uh, if we have time for it. Uh, but just to point out that 69% uh, of the S&P as of Thursday's close above their 50 day moving average, that's up from around 25% at the end of September. So that's quite a swing. That's 44% of the S&P that was below its 50 day moving average now above its 50 day moving average. That's pretty impressive. But what it also reminds me is three out of 10 S&P names, that's 150 out of 500 stocks are still below their 50-day moving average. And it tends to be in the more defensive sectors, things like consumer staples. However, it's worth noting that there still is value in overweighting what's working and underweighting what's not working. I think there could be some opportunities there. Other uh, breadth uh, points to, uh, to register here, the bullish percent index on the S&P still not above 70%. So that's one breadth reading that is not quite giving the all clear bullish sign very close. And I would be looking to see if that's able to register that uh, next week. We talked about sentiment just fine plenty yesterday. So we'll move past that, past that. Just with the moments we have left, I would point out offense over defense, very healthy, looking at the XOY over the XOP and the same thing, an equal weighted version is showing you investors are on the offensive side of the consumer space. The semiconductor index is doing just fine, breaking out on a relative basis this week for the first time in forever. To be honest with you, it's been a while since you've had this ratio break higher. And it shows you there are a lot of names like Xilinx and others that are in pretty decent uptrends. NVIDIA, one of the best long-term charts I could come up with. The ratio of small versus large certainly feels like it's inflecting higher. And you saw a short-term or really a long-term bottom there potentially in August, higher lows there into October, and now making a new swing high. So this ratio has really been in a downtrend uh, for much of 2021. That's starting to change. And I think the strength in small caps and what that implies about some of the leadership sectors, areas like financial, some of the cyclical sectors, they could, su could su uh, surprise some people who are used to small caps not being a great relative bet. So make sure you focus on the small cap opportunities when you can. Let's take a quick break. We'll be back answering your questions from the final bar mailbag. We'll see you in a minute. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to The Final Bar. This is Dave Keller here at StockCharts.com. A couple of quick comments before we get to today's mailbag segment. First off, our, your questions are so welcome. They're so interesting to read. We appreciate the feedback you give us on your show, but uh, on our show, but very much we appreciate questions that are coming up as you are analyzing your own charts. Our email is thefinalbar at stockcharts.com. We're on Twitter at FinalBarSCTV. We're on YouTube on the channel called Stock Charts. Put a comment below the video you're watching there or send us a, an email or a, a tweet with your question. We'll capture all of those and hope to answer one of yours live on the air next week on Tuesday, which will be our next mailbag segment. Also go to stockchartstv.com. That is our on-demand platform. Fantastic guests like we had this week, Christopher Mullen, Joe Rabel, John Coase, our really thoughtful sharp analysts that know their uh, know their stuff special events like the pitch our year in review coming up in december and and lots more great content every trading day go to stockchartstv.com or on your mobile device just search on any of the app stores for stock charts tv on demand let's continue on today's show with the final bar mailbag we appreciate all of your questions and let's get to the first one dave can you walk us through how to create that percent from moving average indicator in acp i don't see that chart style in my ACP, nor do I have a DIST, a distance indicator. Let us bring up the stock charts ACP. I was having a great discussion earlier with Grayson Rose, by the way, who's done such a fantastic job helping to promote all the features and capabilities of ACP, but really taking feedback from me and others and putting it into practice. I'm excited about a lot of the new tools we have coming out the rest of this year and particularly into next year. Uh, a lot of good things coming uh, coming uh, in ACP and in the rest of stockcharts.com for sure. This is the indicator you're mentioning, which is the one I have at the bottom. So this is showing me how far the current price is from its 200-day moving average. It's this uh, sort of histogram thing in green. Now, the way you bring this up, it's a technical, it's an indicator called distance from moving average. Now, I have my ACP set up like this. There are certain indicators that I tend to use more than others. I click the little star next to them that bumps it up on the top of my list, which is why you might not see it on the list down there. So for me, I would I would suggest to you find the indicators you like to use, click the little star that pops it up up here. And then when you're creating a new chart, it's super easy to find it. 
Now you hit on a, a very important thing, which is, um, you know, you don't have that chart style. So it's worth noting that when you create a new chart and it's something that you like and you want to be able to come back to it, go to chart styles, which is the, you know, this object here under here, you can see your styles. These are all the ones that I've created. Um, Grayson Rose, as I mentioned, is sort of a chart style aficionado. So if his login, it's a, a ton of these because he's great about saving all these different looks and being able to flip around them. I tend to be a, a little less um, on top of them as I probably wish I was, but you can see I made a couple of these for like Dave Landry and uh, TG Watkins with his Moxie indicators. I created uh, some chart styles for that. Certain ones for like the, the relative strength rundown when I want to look at relative strength versus different benchmarks for a particular stock. The way that you can do that, by the way, is over here when you bring up the chart style, which is like the little uh, paintbrush, at the very bottom, you see the green button that says, uh, says save chart style. So what you need to do, create a chart, put it, make it just how you like it, put the indicator on the bottom, say save chart style, that will put it here on your list, and then you can always come back to it for, uh, for any ticker at any time. And that is how you add that indicator to ACP, and that's how you save it as a chart style. Super, super cool indicator, by the way. Next question. I liked your MACD crossover answer uh, on Friday. I think that was last week, but I would like to add that to a list of industry groups or stocks. How can I edit a chart list by adding indicators like MACD or PPO? Uh, really, really good question. So what we're going to do is go, I have this uh, chart list of the Dow stocks and uh, we look at the 10 per page and you can see they all use a pretty similar uh, chart style. It's a one-year chart. RSI, uh, uh, yep, RSI, and then the relative strength of the stock versus the S&P. And that's, this is pretty much my common uh, uh, chart style. I often, a lot of times, will do a two-year chart, which looks kind of like this. This is probably the chart I look at the most on the air when we're, when we're doing the show. Now, let's say I wanted to take this list of charts, but add an indicator to all of them. So in sharp charts, there's a couple steps that you need to do. Number one, I would say make the chart look how you want it to. So if I want to change this from price slash performance to MACD or to PPO, I just need to change the setting, click update. That's going to show me my new chart that shows the RSI and then the PPO at the bottom. All right. That's good. Now let's say this is something I might want to come back to. The second step is you want to save this as a chart style. Now this is the same as the chart styles in ACP. Our platform is all built on what are called chart styles, which is basically a template. I have a template of indicators with timeframes and moving averages, whatever else I put on here. And this is something I'm going to want to bring up on a bunch of different charts. So below the, the, uh, the sharp chart, you can see there's this thing called chart styles, similar to an ACP. I have a bunch of these in sharp charts that I've created uh, over time that I've added and I refer to uh, very often. You would want to add a new chart style and say, uh, Dave's kids are great. Uh, and I do this just in case um, the offhand chance that my kids watch the show later, they'll feel really excited about that. So there you go. You're welcome. Then what you want to do is say, I want this template and I want to put it on all the stocks that I have. And that's at the very bottom. It says, apply the ch current chart style to all charts in the selected chart list. I'm not going to do it because I like the chart list the way I have it, but that is how you do it. So three steps to that process. And it's pretty intuitive if you think about it. Number one, make the chart look how you want it. Number two, save that as a new chart style so you can refer to it later. Step three, add that or, or change all of your charts in your chart list to that new chart style. That is the way you can add one cool new indicator to a bunch of charts in your chart list. Next question, here's a puzzle. Stocks above 50-day moving average rising, stocks above 200-day moving average static or falling slightly, short-term strength and long-term weakness. Is that what's we're, uh, what we're seeing? Let me go to that chart in the Mindful Investor Live chart list. This is the one that I think you're referring to. Um, yeah, so stocks above the 50-day uh, rising, certainly since the uh, end of September, that's totally fair. Stocks above the 200-day static or falling slightly, I would agree with you until October when you're actually seeing this turn up a little bit. I don't know if I would call that uh, you know, static or, fall, or going a little bit higher, to be honest with you, depending on how you think about that, uh, that inflection. So is that short-term, so I get it, longer-term weakness, short-term strength. The fact that this one's going up, does that tell you about short-term strength? And this one going down, telling you about long-term weakness. I mean, I mean yes and no. I, I think what this more represents is the fact that when the, the indicator at the bottom goes below 50%, that tells you over half of the stocks are below their 50 day. And that's what you saw here in June. Um, if you look, still 90% of the S&P above their 200 day, and just think about what that chart looks like. It kind of looks like this, if the price was a little bit below its 50 day moving average, right? It's broken down through the fifth day, which means a short week term, well, uh, short term trend, weak short term trend, but not breaking the 200 day, which means the long term trend by that definition is still very uh, you know, consistently strong. 
You then saw, uh, you know, the, the long term of uh, the 200 day going down, which tells you more and more stocks are trading down and actually not just in a short term downtrend, but in more of a long term downtrend, baking the 200 day moving average. Now, this sort of pattern is starting to rotate back to the upside. We have more and more stocks back above their 50 day moving average and not all of them, but many of them starting to regain their 200 day moving average. Currently, it's around 74 percent at the peak in April. It was around 95 uh, plus percent. So, you know, what I say is short term strong and long term weak. I don't know if I would say that to me, this indicator tells you more about the conditions, the characteristics of the stocks making up the indexes and, uh, and, and what sort of dynamics you're seeing. The fact that so many stocks have gone back above their 50 days is, is super encouraging. The fact that at no time in 2021 have less than, a, you know, a third of the S&P been below their a uh, 200 day moving average, I would consider that relatively strong. And you can see the pink dashed lines that I have in here. We haven't talked too much about this indicator getting below 50% because it hasn't done that since July of 2020. But when the market really starts to unwind and when you start to see pullbacks, that's when I start looking at this pink line. And that's what told me in late February of 2020 that things were getting from bad to much, much worse because over half of the S&P had failed to hold their 200 day moving average. We're nowhere near that, even in some of the pullback phases that we've had. So I would say this indicator remaining above 50% and remaining in this case, even above 65% is overall telling you the long-term uh, strength is actually pretty positive. Above 50% positive, below 50% negative is how I would tend to, uh, tend to summarize that. Those are the questions we have time to cover, cover today. Thanks again, everyone, so much for sending in those charts. As a reminder, shoot us an email with your questions, but include a, uh, a link to the chart link below any of the sharp charts. If you look at them, there's this little uh, thing that says permalink. That'll give us a link so we can look at exactly what you're looking at when we answer your question. Makes it super, super easy to do so, but keep them coming. We need to wrap today's show, though. Go to the three and three, three charts, three minutes. Here we go. We're going to spend a minute on this one. This is a study I was doing earlier uh, today for my market misbehavior premium members focusing on the impact of overbought conditions. Not necessarily the impact, but what happens after the S&P is overbought. And if you go back, we weren't really overbought much in 2015, 2016, because it was more of a corrective phase. So I started the clock there and then just looked at two things. Number one, when we were extremely overbought with an RSI above 80, which is incredibly rare, it's only happened three times in the last uh, seven years. The second thing is looking for bearish momentum divergences where the price goes higher and the momentum goes lower. That's something we're not anywhere near because you haven't, you know, you need to make a higher high on lower momentum. We're making higher momentum right now. So that's not on the table at this point, but it's worth noting that the S&P has become extremely overbought three times in the last seven years. Every one of those times has been at or near the end of that upward phase. Now in uh, February, 2017, we pulled back for about a month before resuming the uptrend and, uh, and making new highs into 2018. In January, 2018, we became extremely overbought and stayed there for about three weeks. So keep in, in mind, this isn't just an instantaneous thing. It's the beginning of what has often been a topping process. There you had the 2018 pullback that was obviously a little more painful on a price basis. And then the third time was early September, late August of 2020, which was before that September, October consolidation period. So I'm interested and concerned on the fact that the S&P is nearing extremely overbought levels because I see what has happened soon after going back in this bull market phase. Chart number two is the 10-year interest rate. And uh, as I mentioned, I think yesterday on the show, uh, when John Kosar was on, if there was one chart I looked at to make sense of leadership themes, it would be this one. If this line goes down and we've gone back below 150, we closed today around 145, which is the lowest we've been in the last six weeks. If we continue, if we remain below 1.5% on the 10-year, that is where the growth trade is really going to shine because lower rates tends to be a tailwind for growth stocks. Tech communications names tend to do very, very well. And that's what you're going to see emerge going into uh, the end of the year. If, however, we get back above there and get back into this range and get above 175, ideally, that would be a huge tailwind for the financial sector. Banks selling off after the Fed meeting this week, rates coming down. If that reverts higher, which I think it eventually will, that's a, uh, a, a play on the cyclical trade or the value trade. Finally, I was talking with Grayson Rose earlier. We were on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange interviewing Jay Woods in December 2020 when Bill.com came public. It's up over 300 some percent in that time, uh, trading up in the 300s after uh, IPOing around 30. It's a great reminder of the importance of relative strength. Tom Boley actually wrote a great article yesterday, if you missed it, on the importance of relative strength using NVIDIA. Bill.com is my example. 
of that phenomenon. Folks, that's our show and a wrap for this week on The Final Bar. Thanks so much for joining us every weekday after the close for our show for StockCharts.com in Redmond, Washington. Have a great weekend. We'll see you Monday. Hey, Grayson Rhodes here with Stock Charts. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed that video. If you did, consider giving it a like down below. Maybe leave us a comment. And if you're new to the channel, you can subscribe at the link up above. We're going to bring you daily content from an incredible collection of technical analysts and financial experts.